This lecture is an introduction into cellular structure and function, and it is the first of two parts. So in our endeavor to understand what is life, we've discussed how life is a cell or made of cells, that it maintains homeostasis, it's interdependent, has a metabolism, it evolves, reproduces, and has heredity. So our new focus now is how does a cell accomplish all of these? How is one individual cell able to maintain homeostasis, have a metabolism, and evolve? So first off, well, what is a cell? Here you can see a picture of three different kinds of cells. A cell is considered to be the smallest unit of life, and they have a tremendous amount of diversity in structure and in function. On the top left, you can see a neuron, the kind of cell you'd find in your brain sending signals to one another. In the middle, that's a red blood cell. They all appear dented or as if they're missing something in the middle because they are, they don't have a nucleus. And on the right is a cancer cell. All of these are excellent examples of the fact that they're all cells, but they have tremendous diversity in their structure and function. The two largest categories of cells are prokaryotic cells, those are primarily bacteria, and eukaryotic cells which make up everything else in terms of the life that we've discovered so far. Eukaryotic cells can be either an animal cell or a plant cell. A prokaryotic cell, looking at the entomology or meaning of the words, pro means before, and karyon means nut or kernel. These are cells that don't have a nucleus. That's what the kernel means. Eukaryotic cell, u means well or normal, so they do appear under the microscope to have a nut or kernel. You can see a dot in the middle for the nucleus. So let's look first at prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are single-celled organisms that do not have a nucleus. You can see a prokaryote right here. No nucleus, the DNA inside of it is free floating. It doesn't look like the cells below. You can see a black dot indicating the nucleus on those eukaryotic cheek cells. Prokaryotic cells are very small. They're only between one to 10 micrometers, and a micrometer is 10 to the negative six. You can see on this scale that they're in between the size of a virus and a eukaryotic cell, like an animal cell in your body. They are the oldest cell, meaning with the history of life on Earth, prokaryotes appeared around 3.8 billion years ago. And they're very simple. They have no membrane-bound organelles or tiny organs. And you can see a good comparison in these photos. The bacteria in the top left is a prokaryote. There aren't any little structures, organelles on the inside compared to the eukaryotic cell below where you can see these infolds and structures and characteristics, the organelles that those cells have. Now let's look at eukaryotic cells. These are not your prokaryote. These are super complex cells. The two defining characteristics of them are that they have a nucleus. It's in the middle. It's the one of the largest organelles. And they have membrane-bound organelles. They have infolds, little tiny structures made of membrane that do different functions for the cell. They are large. They're between 10 to 100 micrometers. Here you can see they're larger than prokaryotes, but smaller than multicellular structures like a chicken egg, an ostrich egg, or an adult human. They are younger in evolutionary time. They appeared about 2.7 billion years ago, a good deal later after prokaryotes, and they're complex. They have a large variety of structures and functions. Again, you can see a picture of a neuron, red blood cells, and now intestines. Dramatic diversity in their structure. And this divergence of eukaryotic cells, meaning they take on different shapes and structures, is known as cell differentiations. The cells are different. There are two primary varieties, as I mentioned before, animal and plant. And I want to mention a little bit about both. So plant cells have three structures that are unique to them and only them in terms of eukaryotic cells. The first is they have a cell wall on the outside of the cell, and it provides extra support and structure. Plants don't move, but they can be very, very tall, and the organism has to support its own mass. The cell wall enables that to happen. They also have a large container of water in the middle called a central vacuole. The central vacuole's primary function is to store water, but its secondary function is to apply pressure onto the cell wall, as it fills with water, more and more pressure goes on that cell wall, to make it even more robust in its structure. And they also have a structure known as a chloroplast. The chloroplast is the organelle that's used in photosynthesis to make sugar. Only plant cells have it. This is compared to an animal cell. An animal cell has no cell wall at all. It's pretty flabby. It's mobile, and that makes sense because animals can move. 
It has no chloroplast because animals don't do photosynthesis, and it has very small vacuoles. It doesn't have this need to store water for a long period of time, again, because animals can move. They can go and get water if they need it. So I want to take a tour of the organelles inside a typical eukaryotic cell. An organelle it means tiny organ. These are structures that carry out functions similar to the organs in your body. The goal is to keep the cell alive. You have lungs to get gas exchange going. You have a heart to pump nutrients around your body. So too do cells have different structures that carry out these tasks. So why study cells to begin with? Well, multiple cells make up a tissue, multiple tissues make up an organ, and multiple organs make up an organism. Bodies are made up of cells and many of them. So if we're gonna understand biology, understand living systems and all of their dynamics, we need to understand that fundamental cellular unit that makes up living things like this pug. What kind of jobs do cells do? Think of yourself. You are trillions of cells. Anything you do, you do it not because you need it, but because your hundreds of trillions of cells need to do it. Cells need to breathe, meaning they need to have oxygen come in and CO2 come out. That's why you're breathing all the time. You breathe in to get oxygen to go through your bloodstream to every single cell, and you breathe out because CO2 has been dumped out of every cell, gone to your lungs, and you exhale it. Cells need to eat. That's why you eat. All of those nutrients you take in are dissolved down into molecules that are going to be transported into your cells to sustain them. And they need to be able to make energy, meaning they need to be able to convert those molecules you eat into cellular molecules such as ATP to use for cellular reactions and functions. They also need to be able to build. The structures break over time. They need to be able to make proteins, carbs, fats, and nucleic acids to carry out their functions. They need to be able to remove waste. That's why you urinate. That's why you defecate. That is all coming from waste from your cells. They also need to be able to maintain homeostasis. They need to maintain stable pH, temperature. They also need to be able to respond to their external environment and build more cells. As you grow, you grow because you're making more cells, not because your soils get bigger. So the main jobs of cells can be broken down into three overarching tasks. The first one is to make energy. Cells need to be able to convert biomolecules into a molecule known as ATP to be used for cellular functions. They need to be able to do this and be able to clean up the waste that's produced in the process so that they don't become toxic. They also need to be able to make up proteins. They need to make up the structures that do the chemical reactions in the cell and that make up the cell itself. And they need to be able to make more cells. They have to be able to reproduce because cells have a lifespan, just like all living things. So for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to focus on how cells make energy. As we go through it, I want you to keep in mind of what each organelle looks like. Structure determines function, and if you're presented with a cellular diagram like this, you want to be able to rapidly identify and describe the function of any of these organelles. So cells need power. They need it to make ATP. They need it to fuel their daily life. They need it for growth. They need to be able to digest, take in oxygen, and make ATP, and remove any waste that they generate in the process. The main organelles that carry out this job are the cell membrane, lysosomes, vacuoles and vesicles, the mitochondria, and chloroplasts. I'm going to go over each one. So let's start with the cell membrane. This is found in all types of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. You can see it on the top right. The primary function of the cell membrane is to separate the outside from the inside. We have skin doing that. Cells have a membrane keeping the outside contents out, inside contents in. But just like you, cells need to have things enter, oxygen, sugar, and they need to have things leave, such as waste. So the cell membrane is going to regulate what comes in and what comes out. And it can recognize signals from other cells. As humans, we use sound waves, we use visual cues to communicate. Cells communicate by throwing molecules at each other and receiving them at their cell membranes. The structure of a cell membrane is a double layer of fat. Specifically, it's a double layer of phospholipids, lipids that have a, a functional group and a non-polar fatty acid tail. There is a double layer of these, the polar regions pointing up and down because that's going to be water outside the cell and water inside the cell. So polar attracts polar. And the non-polar regions keep the cell membrane from breaking apart. On a cell diagram such as this, could you find the cell membrane? It surrounds the entire cell. 
It's a cell boundary, controls what comes in and out, and recognizes cell signals. Next up is the cytoplasm and the cytosol. Inside the cell is a lot of space. That space inside the cell is referred to as the cytoplasm. Sometimes it's also referred to as just all of the contents inside the cell. That space is filled with a nutritious liquid called cytosol. Cytosol is providing nutrients to the cell and it's where specific chemical reactions happen. Cytoplasm and cytosol are found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So on a diagram like this, the cytoplasm is just all of that space and the cytosol is making up that jelly. Next up is vacuoles and vesicles. These are found only in eukaryotic cells. The primary function of these is moving material around in the cell and storing it. To be specific, a vacuole is used for storage. It's to keep things contained to be used for later. And vesicles are to move substances around. Both of them are just made up of cell membrane. Here you can see a, ve a vesicle. A substance is taken into a little bit of cell membrane. It forms around it and moves it around. You can also see vacuoles storing things in this diagram. It's just a membranous sac. When we say membrane-bound organelles are found in only eukaryotes, we mean organelles made of membrane. These are two examples of that. They can often also be filled with digestive enzymes or just with nutrients or if an organelle breaks down like you can see in this picture a little bit of a mitochondria that's being dissolved, it can be packaged in a vacuole or vesicle, broken down and recycled to build another new organelle. Some vocab you want to know. Anytime particles fuse with the cell membrane and leave the cell, we refer to that as exocytosis. Exo just means out, cytosis cell. If a particle is so large that cell membrane has to wrap around it and bring it inward, we refer to that as endocytosis. Endo is in. Vacuoles can be very specialized. With plant cells, we have the central vacuole. And in animal cells, oftentimes they'll hold food for later, or they can be used for locomotion. Here you're seeing a paramecium. A paramecium is able to use its vacuole to take in water and then it'll squeeze it and that force is used to actually move the paramecium around as a form of jet propulsion. Plant cells will store it, of course, in their central vacuole. So here's an animation of that movement. You can see a paramecium filling its vacuole with water, then it squeezes it out and that forces it to move in another direction. And this is the kind of momentum we actually see with a lot of animals in aquatic environments as well. On a diagram, could you find vacuoles and vesicles? Honestly, they're very difficult to tell. On a test, you'll never be asked that because how can you tell which one is which? But you're just looking for small containers. Again, vacuoles are used for storage. Vesicles are used for movement or transport inside the cell. Next up are lysosomes. Lysosomes are a specialized version of a vacuole or vesicle. Their primary function is to digest food. They are the garbage truck of the cell. They are containers of Hydraulic enzymes, meaning enzymes that can break molecules down. They're there to digest molecules so they can be absorbed elsewhere, or if an organelle breaks down, the lysosomes will destroy it, dissolve it, and it'll be used to build anew. Its structure, again, is a membranous sac, and it is found in eukaryotic cells. So here's a small food particle. You can see it's fusing with the lysosome. That lysosome brings digestive enzymes. Those enzymes break down that food into smaller particles that can then be used. Why do you think cells do this? With vacuoles, vesicles, and lysomes, we're putting things in compartments. What is the advantage of putting something in a box? Well, it's to separate inside from outside, specifically to create environments separate from the rest of the cell. For example, a lysosome having digestive enzymes is slightly acidic. Its pH is 4 or 5, whereas the inside of the cell remains somewhat neutral at 7. By having a container, you can make a micro environment that's slightly acidic, and now you can have two different reactions, one at a pH of 5, one at a pH of 7 outside of it occur at the same time. These micro environments create complexity and enable the cell to do all the activities that it does. Cells can get damaged and organelles often fail. Also, organisms can become infected. You can become infected with a parasitic worm. Lysosomes help solve all of these problems. If a, lys if a organelle breaks down, a lysosome will just dissolve it and it'll be used to build a new one. Let's say a cell is beyond repair and all hope is lost. A cell can actually be triggered to do what's called apoptosis or cell suicide. That'll signal the cell to open all of its lysosomes at once and it'll dissolve from the inside out. 
Why would this happen? Well, you're an organism of 100 trillion cells. If one cell is becoming defunct and harmful to you, it's better for the overall organism for that one cell to self-destruct than for it to reproduce and continue its harmful effects. And if you have a parasitic worm, lysosomes are actually little grenades. Cells will go up and throw lysosomes at the worm to dissolve it in a small enough chunk so that your body can finally break it down and get it out. Could you find a lysosome in this diagram? Again, it's difficult. You can't really tell because of how small they are, but just know lysosomes, they contain enzymes, they're used for digestion. They're basically the garbage disposal and recycling mechanism of the cell. Next up is getting that energy. That is the focus of all these organelles, right? That brings us to the mighty mitochondria. It's found in all eukaryotic cells. Its primary function is it can make ATP, which is molecular energy for cells, through a process called cellular respiration. Basically, sugar in the presence of oxygen is going to be broken down to make the ATP the cell needs to function. It fuels the work of life. Its structure is a double membrane. It has an inner membrane and an outer membrane, which makes it very unique in terms of organelles. And it is found in both animal and plant cells. So knowing that the mitochondria is used to make ATP and that's needed for energy, think of your own body. You have skin cells, heart cells, lung cells. What kind of human cells do you think have the most mitochondria and the least? Well, it turns out that liver cells have the most. On average, they have 1,000 to 2,000 mitochondria. A muscle cell only has 750 to 1,000. A fat cell is 100, and wet blood cells have none. Interesting. First off, know that the number of organelles is different in every kind of cell type. That's what makes them unique. Things like the liver and muscle cell need a lot of ATP to carry out their functions, whereas a red blood cell, which is moved by the contractions of your heart and only carries particles, doesn't need ATP. It doesn't need that energy to do what it does. Could you find the mitochondria on this diagram? You're looking for the double folded kidney bean looking structure. The, again, the mitochondria is used to break down sugar in the presence of oxygen to make ATP to fuel the cell's reactions. Now we'd be amiss to not talk about the chloroplast. Plant cells also have a mitochondria. They need to break down sugar and use it to make it for ATP, but plants don't eat. We eat and bring the sugar to the mitochondria in our cells. A plant needs to be able to make its own food. The chloroplast is the organelle that's going to do that. It's able to take energy from sunlight and molecules in the atmosphere, specifically CO2 and water, and use that to build sugar. After the chloroplast builds the sugar, it will then go to the mitochondria where it's broken down to turn into ATP. The chloroplast is only in eukaryotic plant cells. Did I mention that mitochondria is in both plant and animal cells? I might want to mention it again because this is the most missed item by my students. A lot of times students think that plant cells don't have a mitochondria, they only have a chloroplast. The chloroplast is to make food, the mitochondria is to break it down. So plants need both. They have to make their food and break it down, whereas us animals, we have clever ways of getting food in our environment, so we just bring it into our bodies for the mitochondria to break down. So this is how cells make power. The cell membrane is how foods are going to get in, waste is going to get out. The lysosome is going to break that food down. It's going to be captured in a vacuole and stored or moved by a vesicle. And the mitochondria is going to break it down to make ATP. In the case of plant cells, they're going to use the chloroplast to make sugar, and then that'll go to the mitochondria. Hopefully, this lecture has prepared you to answer a question such as this. If I were to give you this cell diagram, the cell shown to the right is encountered a source of glucose, a simple carbohydrate. Describe the path glucose will take to enter the cell and identify its final destination. Could you draw on a diagram where that glucose goes and identify every organelle it encounters going from that glucose to being broken down as ATP? Could you identify and describe how the cell would manage each of these instances? What if a mitochondria became damaged beyond repair? What would the cell do? What if a bunch of waste was built up in the cell and needed to be released? How could a cell accomplish that? Today we have learned what organelles are involved in all of those. So today we only covered how cells make energy. In the second part of cellular structure and function, we will look at how cells make proteins and how cell organelles are used to make more cells. I'll see you next time.